but two, more their activity of producing more CO2 isn't balanced by the extra growth in green plants that would absorb CO2. Uh, warmer oceans. The, uh, the oceans are a huge sink for carbon dioxide. And uh, it used to be thought that they could absorb as much as we were going to put out. But it's clear that the oceans are being stressed more rapidly than we anticipated. The pH, the acidity of surface water is starting to get much uh, lower than we expected because of the extra CO2 that's being absorbed. Uh, and there's a potential that some of the impacts of climate change could actually slow ocean currents down and make them more sluggish and have less photosynthetic activity in the oceans as a result. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the weathering of rocks because of acid rain actually absorbs carbon dioxide, and that's a negative feedback. Uh, I made this map uh, yesterday. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I was thinking about when I was trying to put this talk together, when I was in graduate school, the director of my program gave a talk about sea level rise and climate change, and that was in probably in 81, 82. And he had a graphic like this that, uh, that really affected me. It made it clear to me how vulnerable we are to minor amounts of sea level rise. Uh, this kind of purple area, it's hard to see on screen, uh, but each of those is a little bar in each census tract. It's the amount of people that live in that census tract. And uh, like over here, you can see in the legend, that something that high is 36,000 people. Uh, the, uh, the orange shaded things down to yellow are population density throughout the country. So really what you're seeing here is that fi almost 50% of the people in the country live within 50 miles of the shoreline, including the Great Lakes. So, and we saw in Katrina when there was a, a huge storm that affected, uh, f that caused vast uh, flooding, the kind of exodus that might result from unexpected levels of sea level rise is, is pretty overwhelming and it could happen in many parts of the world, because this, this story is pretty similar in most countries that, that have shorelines. What we know about uh, sea level rise locally, uh, there's, there's very strong implications for New Jersey. Uh, it's, a, it's a coastal state and very high, with very high population density, and the state has, is pretty much built out as much as it can be with a lot of prior loss of wetlands. And wetlands provide a buffer for sea level rise and storm activity. Uh, so some of the direct effects that, to worry about over the next 20, 40, 50 years in New Jersey is uh, inundation of dry land, shore erosion, wetland accretion rates uh, keeping up with erosion. And these are already problems that, uh, that we have right now with natural levels of sea level rise, because every area has some rate of sea level rise or decline. It's much worse on the Gulf Coast, but it's two to three centimeters per year in, uh, in the Northeast. So above that, if you increase that level, it's just whether, whether our systems can keep up with increased sea level rise. Uh, there are some things that will have to be done uh, if sea level rise is, is faster than expected. Uh, there's engineering solutions, there's uh, changes in development patterns, and in the worst case is retreat, where you just give up certain communities because you can't keep up with it and it's not worth uh, uh, what you'd have to do to, to deal with it. Uh, I thought it would be helpful to go through a chronology of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the scientific and, uh, and interagency and, and international efforts to deal with climate change. Really, uh, the first time there was an international meeting to evaluate climate change was in 1979. Uh, there have been a number of efforts uh, over time through that. The International Governmental Panel on Climate Change was formed in 1988. Now, that's the body that in 2007 came out with a very firm and detailed assessment of the problem. And uh, this, this book is a summary of their findings. And uh, I think the one that most of us are familiar with as being controversial is Kyoto. What climate change, when it was just science in the 70s and there was just a ta lot of talk about how to evaluate the problem, it wasn't that controversial. But when it got down to the point where uh, 
different countries were starting to accept that it was an issue, it got down to, well, who's going to pay for it and who's going to maybe have to limit the way they're doing things right now? And that created conflict between rich and poor countries. And Kyoto, that sort of came to a head, where the United States would not sign on to it because it wanted developing countries to, to make commitments that they weren't ready to make. And uh, it wouldn't accept these limits, what, what the administration at the time thought were un unacceptable limits on the economy, making sort of a, what I think is a false choice between environmental protection and the economy. Uh, and for the past nine years or so, we've been kind of in the darkness. Uh, a lot of things that you're seeing on my agency's website now about climate change were kind of buried for the past nine years. And last year, there started to be a sort of a defrosting of that, uh, that kind of lockdown on what you could say. But a lot of the material that's up there was there in, say, 1999 and has uh, reemerged in the past couple of years. Uh, one of the things that, that's really uh, hampered useful discussion of climate change is there is a lot of propaganda uh, from companies that benefit from climate, uh, from continued burning of fossil fuels, and Exxon is the worst actor. A lot of the energy producers have actually changed their tune and are trying to look into alternate forms of energy, but Exxon is pretty much the only company that thinks they're going to keep producing oil until the last drop, and they're the most profitable co company in the world right now. And they've done some pretty nasty things that are modeled after the way cigarette companies avoided any restrictions on, on cigarette smoking and, and, and come into the accepted conclusion that cigarette smoking caused cancer. Uh, Exxon actually consulted with a lot of the same consulting firms that helped Philip Morris, and they've done a few things like build fake uh, scientific and nonprofit groups to sort of promote uh, debunking of, of climate as an issue, climate change as an issue. And uh, that's started to become less effective. Uh, let's go to some of the things that are predicted at different levels of uh, certainty in the IPCC report are more extremes of temperature in different parts of the world. Uh, temperature rise of 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius or around 3 Fahrenheit, 3 to 5 Fahrenheit. Uh, warming over inhabited continents by 2030 will, will be about double the observed. Or this is very likely, 90% certainty. Uh, increased methane concentrations unprecedented levels of CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, increased frequency of warm spells and heat waves, which is particularly important for seniors. Uh, in Europe in 2003, when there was a huge heat wave, a lot of people died. Uh, so if you don't have access to air conditioning or if power outages knock out your air conditioning, uh, some of these issues in abstract sound like, oh, so it'll get a little hotter. But in reality, it's a, it's a huge public health concern. Uh, changes in precipitation in different parts of the world. And one very scary scenario is uh, a drastic change in ocean circulation. And I have a, another slide that I'll talk about that a little more. Uh, here's a good uh, frequently cited example of what may be a glaring example of, of climate change. The snows of Kilimanjaro basically don't exist anymore. This is from uh, 1912 to 1970 to 2000 to 2007, and you can see it's accelerating in recent years. Threshold effects. Uh, there are certain events that could happen under different scenarios that might drastically accelerate impacts of climate change. And to date, a lot of the, uh, the frozen, a lot of the water that might cause sea level rise is bound in ice. Uh, a huge amount of it is in Iceland and also in Antarctica. If the Iceland ice sheet started to dissolve, 